Good evening, Good evening. Uh, and welcome, welcome to this evening's. Oh, we're just getting a bit of feedback there. Just bear me one second. Apologies for that. Um, good evening and welcome to this evening's uh, talk, the first of three talks this week, um, where we will be, tomorrow night, we will be talking to Nada Khan, adventure photographer, and then on Friday we'll be talking to Becca Coles, who's an alpinist as well, so you might want to join us for one of those. Um, but this evening we're excited to have Kerry Wallace here from Girls on the Hills. She's a, um, a trail runner um, and she runs, or well, she's a co-founder of Girls on Hills, Scotland's um, only uh, trail running and fell running company uh, to cater exclusively for, for women. So it's, um, it's great to have her here with us. She's just on mute at the moment, but I, she will be unmuted very soon. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, just a few things. If, as when Kerry gets started, um, you can post any questions you like using the chat function at the bottom if you're on Zoom. Um, we are um, going to be streaming live on Facebook as well. So if you're on Facebook, then you will want to maybe add in the comments any questions as well, and they will come to me here and I'll ask Kerry at the very end um, about those um, for those questions. Um, and um, I do hope that you'll you'll stick around till the very end because at the very end we have a um a, a competition to offer you so um hopefully you will um enjoy the talk and still be with us to ask some questions and enter the competition as well so without further ado um i'd like to invite kerry to switch on her microphone and uh i will um i will hand over to her here we go so there we go. Kerry, are you with us? Hello. <laughs> can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes, thank you. Um, so, Kerry, I, um, over to you. I'm going to uh, disappear. <laughs> okay. okay. All right, over to you. Hi. Well, thanks for, for joining me. We're uh, in sunny Balahulish at the moment, and um, Ellis Brigham have asked me to speak to you this evening about uh, why trail running. So that's kind of why trail running for me, how did I start trail running, and uh, why do so many people love trail running? Um, so it's kind of a, a bit like a talk of two halves, really. Um, the first bit is how did I get into trail running? Well, I definitely didn't get into trail running at a young age. I think I was like most children and to be honest, really hated running. Uh, I grew up in the West Country, so it, there was no mountain running for me as a child. Um, I was kind of running around on beaches and uh, moorland and that kind of thing. Um, and some of my earliest experiences of, uh, of running were actually, um, oh, one moment, I can't seem to move through my slides. There we go. Um, was actually, uh, surf life saving championships and events and this is me doing uh, beach flags uh, I was national champion at beach flags um, at, when I was a junior uh, which is yeah a completely obscure sport that nobody else has probably ever heard of um, but took up quite a lot of my time as a child uh, competing in these events um, and also uh, athletics this is the county championships I was always a sprinter definitely no long distance running for me and the thing that I remember most about it was how I absolutely hated it. The, the, the competition, the nerves, I was always just sick to my stomach with nerves. Um, and it totally ruined it for me. Um, and the, the pressure and the structure and any time there was a meet or a competition, a tournament, I just hated it. I was always so nervous. Um, and I, my childhood was really dominated by playing a lot of sports. And it was always like that. I was always nervous about competitions. The one thing that I did do dabble with or tried at that same age age 12 was, was rock climbing and this was me age 12 at, at a school activities week it was the first time i ever tried climbing and i absolutely loved it and i thought this is something i really want to do it didn't have that kind of competition feel it didn't feel competitive and i um but i couldn't find a way to do it i couldn't find a way to get into it so after that one week of rock climbing i i never actually touched rock again until i was in my mid-20s so um 
I just couldn't find an avenue uh, to, to pursue the sport. So yeah, running and, and climbing and mountains were just not, not on the agenda at all for me um, until quite a lot later in my life. Um, it was actually uh, 2006 when completely randomly some friends of the family said, do you want to join a, a three peaks challenge? Like many people do walk up the three highest peaks in the UK um, and, uh, you know, see how you get on and, and have the experience. And I thought, well, that sounds amazing. I've never been up a mountain before. Give that a crack. Um, and unfortunately, that also uh, was not to be because um, the very first summit we tried to, to climb was, was Ben Nevis. And I had a, a kind of really terrible experience that day on the hill where I was uh, encountered a gentleman who had had a heart attack. Um, and unfortunately he needed uh, first aid and I, I had recently done uh, first aid qualification. So I ended up stepping forward and, and giving CPR and, and speaking to the mountain rescue and, and giving them our coordinates and the weather was deteriorating. And it, it was all a highly stressful experience. And unfortunately the, the, the guy uh, didn't make it. Um, it was really sad. He had, he had family um, and I found it really traumatic and it took me a long time to get to get over it and sort of come to terms with the fact that you know I couldn't have done done more or that it wasn't my fault or I shouldn't have done something differently um it really really affected me um and that was my first ever time on a mountain so it probably wasn't ideal but the thing was that prior to that actually happening I was having a really amazing time and I was thinking this is incredible I really want to be in the hills this is just like so exciting and I totally loved it so I was struck by this real kind of um I don't know internal battle between I want to do more of this but I realize that there's this safety aspect and I want to be able to, to do this safe safely and I want to know what I'm doing I want to be competent so I just I went on a bit of a well my life really went on a bit of a tangent at that point and I totally totally changed direction so um the following year which was 2007 everything was different I I decided that um I was going to quit my job. I was going to move to North Wales. I was going to take up rock climbing. I was going to go fell running. I was going to be this totally different person. This is just what I wanted to do. Um, so I thought it would be a really good idea to teach myself to navigate by reading a book and then signing up to the Low Alpine Mountain Marathon, which was my first ever hill race. Um, turns out that's actually a really bad idea um, and it went horrendous. It was terrible. Everything that could possibly have gone wrong went wrong. We were on the hill for so long. Um, and there were lots of tears and it was it was hard um but I, again i just totally loved it and i just thought this is brilliant i want to do more of this um and the same year i started rock climbing i thought i'm going to sign up to become uh, to do my training to become a rock climbing instructor um i just literally threw myself in the deep end i, th I thought i've got loads of time to make up for and this has been too long in the too long to to come so yeah i'm going to make up for the for the lost time so yeah i went straight into that um and i've never really looked back and climbing and running have been a really big part of my life ever since and and totally in parallel with each other as well um and when mark asked me to mention uh where running has taken me it made me realize that actually it's not if i think about that from a geographical point of view it's not running that's taking me places it's it's climbing that's taking me places and i really spent a lot of many years climbing all over the world so there's this i've actually quite enjoyed just going through my hard drive and taking out old photographs but these are just a, a tiny portion of, of the photographs that from experiences of climbing in different places on rock and ice and in the alps and so there's pictures here from from morocco and and uh red rocks and yosemite and konya and chamonix and just you know have, have had amazing time traveling around climbing um but i never really never really ran abroad um to me running was always something that I did um, did at home, did in, in Scotland or in North Wales when I first started. Um, and it was just the way that I kind of explored the, the hills and the mountains that I, where I lived. And um, I've definitely done more, I feel like I've done more running than I have climbing because I used to always run when it was wet. <laughs> and it was more often not suitable for climbing and more suitable for running. So I definitely felt like I did a lot more of that. Um, and that's how I got to know the hills really. Um, 
and I did do races as well um, and I carried on doing the mountain marathons I used to do a few a year um because I just found them to be a way to to run and to race in the mountains without again having that nervous kind of start line feeling and of competing with others I, I really like the way the format of kind of racing with somebody racing against yourself um, not having you know competing with other people but not not in that in that kind of same way I found it quite a relaxed way of uh, of, of racing um, but I've always done fell races as well, but just not not loads. I, I tend to just do a few, a handful a year. I'm definitely not one of those people that race every single weekend. For me, fell running is not synonymous with fell racing at all. I definitely just mostly run in the hills um, with friends or by myself, um, and that that's what I've been doing, you know, for, for years and years now. Um, and uh, it got to a point where I thought, do you know, I really want to to push myself and challenge myself, but I didn't know where to take it. So I kind of decided to come up with my own challenge um, rather than enter an event. So I, I, I can drive this thing called the UK Big Three Challenge, which was around, uh, I think it was 2011. I'd always had an interest in um, the Bob Graham round, the Paddy Buckley round and the Charlie Ramsey round, but I always thought I'll, I'll never be able to do those in 24 hours. So why don't I just do them all together in one long journey and just make it my own. So. I decided that this was going to be my challenge um, but the thing that intimidated me about it which is the reason why I wanted to do it wasn't that it was really long I actually thought it would go fine it was actually just that um, that I wanted to do it completely solo and I wanted to do all the navigation by myself and I wanted it to be an independent thing um, and that made me really nervous um, so I started training and planning it I should say that I didn't know anybody who'd done any of these three rounds, by the way. I just literally bought the maps and went to these places and started exploring and checking bits out and wrecking things and plotting and, and yeah, making my own plan for it. So it was it was pretty much um, all my own, I don't know, idea. Um, so I didn't start in the normal places and finish in the normal places. I, I decided not to carry loads of stuff. I didn't carry a tent and I didn't carry food for days I just treated it like a stage race really and I just did a day and stopped overnight a day and stopped overnight um, and I only had support off the hill I stayed in kind of I don't know historical mountaineering establishments around around the UK it was amazing it was quite a journey um, but I also had uh, the idea was to do it in 10 days uh, the three rounds um, with driving in between but I had terrible terrible weather um so i started off with the welsh round you can see bottom right there um that's uh, mole shabbat and top right is over the glitters it was really bad visibility and hail and they were quite long days so i found it quite stressful constantly decision making constantly navigating um but i got through that round um got up to the lake district to do the bob graham round and it was just so windy and it got windier and windier until i think it was the second day it was 100 mile an hour on the tops. It's forecast to be 100 mile an hour on the tops. And I just had to draw a line under it and say, you know, I can't, I can't do that. And I was gutted, gutted that I had failed already. Um, but then I just thought, well, actually, I'll just do two days in one day. So on the third day, I just did two legs um, instead. Um, and yeah, just got back on schedule. So I thought, do you know what, this has been really bad, but I actually think this this might go this is this could be in the bag now um and uh but unfortunately by the time i got home to scotland it got even worse um and yeah it was a blizzard and it was like really strong winds and by the time i got here which is uh this is actually the summit of anik beg it, i'd already been blown over a few times my phone had died um and i thought i just don't think this is safe anymore um so i called it i called it and uh so out of the 113 summits that i was supposed to do i did 111 and uh yeah i failed on my challenge um and that was a really steep learning curve for me because i was devastated and put so much hard work into it but i think when you put so much effort into something it's sort of in proportion to what you can get back out of it so although it took me a while to kind of to realize it and step back and see it. I actually learned more about myself, um, learned about my strengths and weaknesses um, as a person, but also about my running, you know, what, what my weaknesses are and, and where I where I can keep on pushing through that challenge than I have pretty much anything else. Um, and if anyone else is interested in taking that kind of more, if you like, accessible approach to those rounds, there is a chapter in the back of uh, David Linton's book, um, 
that I've written that uh, that you can read a little bit more about what what I did there. But yeah, so that was kind of a really life changing or running changing moment for me to do that um, challenge. And and off the back of that, I really started to um, explore more around where I live, uh, which is here in Glencoe. And um, this is me in a stretcher with a mountain rescue team training. So I joined the Glencoe mountain rescue team and I really got to know the hills around home, um, all the nooks and crannies and all the places that you would never actually choose to go. Um, and that's how I got to know the area where I, where I now work. Um, but I was probably only on the team for maybe four or five years. I sort of felt that I'd almost come full circle since that day on the Ben when the mountain rescue had to come up and help this casualty. And, and I had some dealings with them then and, and felt completely useless. It felt like qu quite nice to be able to join the team and, and to be useful for a, for a while. And so, yeah, I did sort of four or five years of uh, on the team before uh, this happened. Um, so I had two children and everything completely changed. Suddenly there just wasn't enough time for, for climbing and traveling and running and racing and training and work. Um, so yeah, I just couldn't fit it all in. Um, and that hit me pretty hard for a while, trying to work out how to juggle it all. Um, and I realized that something had to give. Um, but I also realized that, I guess I'm not, I'm not the mum I want to be if I don't run. So as long as I get out and get some running and I feel fit and healthy, then I can be a much better mum to my girls. And it, it really helps balance me out. So um, I guess I had to admit that running had become a bit more than a hobby for me. Um, it definitely become part of who I, who I am. And so it was at that point that I kind of took what I'd learned before, which was, <laughs> you know, that, that experience early on on Ben Nevis, it kind of used, it made me feel like life's too short. You need to just get on and do things. And, and so I thought, well, do you know what? Life is too short to not do what you, what you want to do with it. So um, that's when I sort of took the leap really and started Girls on Hills uh, with my friend, Nancy, who is in the picture up there. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, yeah, we started that three years ago now. Um, and the idea is to, really empower women, I suppose, with, by using outdoor recreation, by using running, by using hill walking, um, and, and to empower them with the skills and the, the confidence to go out and do some of this stuff themselves. It's like a terrible business model because I'm always telling people, you don't really need me. This is all you need to do. And you can go and do this by yourself. Uh, but that, but that is the idea. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been brilliant. It's been really good fun. Uh, you know, we've had a bit more success than we ever thought we would, um, which has been great, but also it's just been really, really good fun. Um, and, you know, I have no idea, I've no idea where it will go next. So certainly at the moment, it's not going very far with us all being in, in lockdown up here, but um, yeah. Uh, so I made running my work and that definitely helped free up some time for, for the family. So it really helped me balance my running with my family commitments um so so that was the next step but alongside that i've always uh, kept my personal running going but since having the, having a family i've felt that the need to really focus in on the sort of running that i enjoy most so for me that's i suppose it's harking back a little bit to the climbing that i miss because i don't really do as much now or any really um hopefully that'll change but you know uh, so it's sort of technical running or I, I like mixing up scrambling in the mountains with with running or um sort of high high mountain running um and, and even getting out in the winter um and just sort of pushing my boundaries a little bit and finding out um you know what I can and can't do it's always inspired me just to to try and find out what the next thing is that I don't know if it's possible and then and have a crack at it and see if it'll go so that's kind of where I'm at just now, um, focusing in on that kind of running that I really enjoy. So more sky running, um, definitely on the cards um, for me. But what has drawn me to running, I'm sure has drawn many, many people to running. But I think what's interesting about trail running is the fact that it just appeals to so many people. I've, I've read a report that says that uh, it's one of the, or it's the fastest growing sport in Europe at the moment. Um, and it doesn't surprise me really because of it's just so, so varied really. It's such a broad, it's a kind of an umbrella term really for so many types of running. But um, even if you just look at running on its purest sense, so take out the trail aspect, it has loads of health benefits. Um, 
so it can uh, be used as a tool for for managing stress um, for anxiety depression weight management it actually is really good for preventing pre pre preventing uh, osteoporosis so people always say oh you know runners are oh, you're gonna have terrible news when you get old but actually it show it's been shown to improve knee health um lowering the chances of, of certain types of cancer increasing your life expectancy and then like most sports there's all those social benefits um not so many right enough at the moment but you know of clubs and events and races and all the things that you can do with that sport in terms of meeting other people and interacting with people so there's so many benefits um for running in general but i think one of the added appeals about trail running is the fact that it brings you out into into nature into uh into green spaces um and i think it was 2018 when doctors uh, in scotland first started prescribing time in nature time in green spaces uh, to their patients to to treat things or to, to manage conditions like anxiety and high blood pressure and stress um, and it's actually you know been scientifically proven that that is a you know that is a tangible effect um, and it's actually only two hours a week that you need to spend in that environment to really see those measurable differences in terms of health and well-being um, and I just think that that's a really amazing thing and and I, I definitely think that um, that's the reason why you you get that kind of runner's high when you if you're a runner and you run a lot then you do get a kind of runner's high when you go running and I think that's just a, it's even more pronounced if you can do that in 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 a, in a natural place in an open place and this study um, that is on the screen here it was 20,000 people um, were analysed for this report and uh, it was shown that the effect doesn't actually work in kind of urban parks. It, it's, it has to be really in nature and in green spaces and, and it even showed that the best effect was kind of areas of outstanding nat natural beauty. So it really is to do with getting out there and, and enjoying the, the scenery and, and the, the environment around you. Um, and I think that's a, for me anyway, that's a really big part of trail running, certainly up, up here in the mountains. Um, and, and that's definitely part of the appeal. And I think perhaps in modern life with the kind of busy lifestyles that we all lead and hectic schedules and lots of uh, commitments and everything so managed and health and safety conscious and there's just so much going on it's there's almost more benefit to be felt by stepping away from all that and some of these sort of anecdotal things i've written on the screen like a sense of escapism um, being able to get a bit of perspective, being able to get privacy or me time and headspace away from whether it's work or family commitments, all those sorts of things. Those are really the things that that I take away from trail running and from hill running, from fell running um, the most. And that, that's definitely my appeal. And I think the growing interest and, and popularity of trail running relates mostly to those things and to the fact that they are, you know, sadly difficult to come by uh, in our day-to-day -day working lives and so i think that's why they're so important and i think that's why um we're seeing so many people take up running now um in in this uh global pandemic because those it, it's those feelings of being kind of those that feeling of cabin fever is really um heightened and yeah i think running is a, a release and escapism that lots of people have kind of started to tap into and there was a report um just recently looking at data from garmin wearers watch wearers and, and devices um and it showed that there was a 50 percent decrease in the number of people running on their treadmills and, and a simultaneous 50 percent increase in people getting outside and running and we've probably all seen how people are just itching to get back to the hills and to the countryside to the park and to the coast and to get to these open spaces and so i think that that's why um trail running is so popular and and i can totally buy into that that's that's totally how i feel um and i do think that maybe after all this is over and, and lockdown is completely lifted and we can do what we like again eventually um maybe trail running will be you know bigger than bigger than it's ever been but we'll see and that's the end that's the end of my talk Great, thank you, Kerry. That's um, that's brilliant. Um, we've, we've had a few questions, so um, if you don't mind me uh, putting them to you, um, I'll just uh, I'll just 
Well, there we go. We've got the slide with the questions. Um, so Anne, Anne Weir asks, um, how do you manage injury given it's your career? Do you worry that an injury could jeopardise what you have? Yes. Um, funnily enough, I've always been really injury prone. Um, and that is actually another driver that, that forced me into trail running early on. I, I did do some road running initially and I found I was really, really injury prone. And with the trail running, I find I'm far, far less injury prone and actually even more so in the mountains. And I think that's because um, the style of running that I do mostly is I, there's obviously a lot of walking involved. So I find that to be um, a really nice way of easing off and keeping everything really gradual. Um, and I, personally, I find that if I'm running and walking in the hills and I'm keeping that at a certain level without changing too much, I'm, I'm pretty much fine. I, I can keep on, keep on doing that. It's actually, I'm sure most runners would, would understand this, but it's, it's when things change, when you change aspects of your training or change aspects of your, sometimes even, you know, footwear, um, that you can, uh, you can experience um, this, the start of a niggle or you start to train harder or increase your mileage or your, the amount of ascent that you're putting into your training. So, so I'm really wary of making any changes and, you know, dramatically I try to, to do things, ease, ease those sorts of changes in. But yeah, it's a big concern now. Um, I have to be really wary and be really careful of it. So just try to be really mindful of, of preventative measures, really. Okay. Um, Kevin, Kevin Biles on Facebook says, um, what is your favourite trails in the UK? Wow, that is a difficult question. Um, I don't know if I could say I have a favourite trail. Do you know, I'm probably one of those people that just never really wants to run the same trail two days in a row. And so even, you know, even locally, I always am always mixing it up to go to something that I haven't been to for a while. I think actually it's kind of the opposite thing. It's just the novelty factor. So anything new, anything different um, is always is always a great one. And I tend not to want to run the same. You know, obviously there's routes that I do a lot more than others locally um, and it would probably if I had to choose it would be something with scram with plenty of scrambling in it something like um something around the co probably um but yeah mostly I just like to to try different to try different things in different places yeah great um Nicola Diggins asks what do you carry and eat in the way of food on a long hill day um, what do I carry and eat in terms of food? Um, basically just food <laughs> and not gels. So I, you know, if I was racing, I do sometimes carry like um, sports nutrition in the form of gels or mixes or sweets or whatever. But I found that more recently, um, you know, I can go for longer and I feel better if I just eat normal food. So it's, it's things that I can, um, I suppose it's similar to, to the approach that people take when they're running an ultra distance event or something like that. It's something that's really palatable to you and um, that you know that you can tolerate um, and that you can eat on the go and it's not going to uh, make you feel, feel really horrible. Um, I take quite a lot of things like hot cross buns um, and I quite like pork pies, even though they're really dense and heavy. I definitely, if it's a long run, if it's a big day, I definitely crave uh, calories in, in the form of like of fat really. So it's like cheese and pork pies and things that probably I'm not supposed to take, but I never really want um, much in the way of, of carbs. So it tends, you know, in terms of sh sugars. So I, yeah, I tend to, to just take things that maybe salty and fatty that I want to eat along the way something I'm going to enjoy. Good honest answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lisa Marshall asks, how do you minimise um, your risk of injury? I think you've, um, yeah, you've, you've kind of answered that one. Um, but you did, you did also say, do you do a lot of strength work in preparation? So um, whilst the question before was, um, how do you manage injury? This is sort of how do you, how do you limit your risk of injury? You know, what sort of training do you do? I think I do try to do a bit of cross training. I'd like to do more, but I do feel that I sort of touched on this earlier, but I kind of, I'm definitely trying to balance the whole running thing with the family commitment. Um, and I, I don't, it just, there's not enough time. I'd love to do more, more core strength and conditioning uh, and, and just general sort of strength and conditioning work. But I, I actually try to build that into my running more in terms of just the style of running that I do. So more 
whether it's be more hill work or different styles of workouts as part of of my training um i do as i mentioned before quite a bit of scrambling i have a, a bouldering wall at home i can do some climbing um and yeah I, I try to mix things up a bit like that and if if i feel that i've got a bit of a, a niggle coming on perhaps i do a bit more cycling or something to take some of the pressure off um and and keep that aerobic uh, work going so yeah i i definitely need the answer is probably that I should do a lot more, um, but I, I definitely also believe in a kind of um, a, of a specificity of training, you know, so I do largely do in training what I do for racing. So, but as I said before, racing is a, a very small component for me of, of, um, of what I do. I don't do a lot of racing. And so my, my work and my own personal running is generally pretty relaxed to be honest and and that means that there's a much lower risk of injury i think okay great um just sorry i'm looking down to look at my phone we just got a few questions from um uh here's a good good question during uh during lockdown gail samson on facebook says um any reading recommendations for those of us missing the hills oh um one book but uh yeah okay um i think if you haven't read feet in the clouds you should read that one to start with if you're interested in being inspired for running in the mountains i think that was one of my first in, you know reads that really got me interested in the sort of british fell running start scene um so give that one a read definitely richard asquith i think it is That's feet in the clouds is it yeah yeah okay great thank you um Question from Colin Way. What ambitions have you got for the future? Oh, do you know, I sort of feel like it's one of those questions where you like you don't really want to say in case you look a bit stupid because it'll be something totally impossible. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'd really love to do some, um, I'd like to do, I'd like to have a crack at one of the rounds at some point um, that I mentioned in the three, you know, when I first did those, I was like, oh, I'll never be able to do one of those rounds. It's totally unrealistic. Um, and, you know, it didn't, it wasn't even on my radar, but as I've done so much more running over the years, I've started to think actually maybe that would, wouldn't be too bad. And I'd like to, to do that. And I think not you know, just really because it feels like as somebody who loves running and, and it's, been involved in the running community for a long time. It feels like it's something that you have to do, like a rite of passage. I feel like I need to go and do do that. So um, I'd really love to, but I'm fully aware that there's a lot of time commitment there, and uh, I just don't have that right at the moment. So that's a definite ambition. And there are big races in the Alps I'd love to go and do. I'd like to do it. Uh, I actually was entered, had a place for. Um, a uh, race in Switzerland this year, a sky, an extreme sky race I was really excited about doing, which has obviously been cancelled. So um, I'd like to do some more international sort of sky racing. That'd be great too. Um, I've got a question for myself. Um, as, a, as a father of three girls, how do you, because um, how, how old are your children? Uh, three and five. <laughs> okay, so similar, similar ages. Um, how do you, how do you, go about getting maybe the five-year-old interested in running she's just started to sort of go on a few little few little runs but um she much prefers riding a bike at the moment which is yeah which is fine. <laughs> yeah so we haven't actually tackled we only very recently started to tackle running with her um again like you say she's done so she's done some biking and she's cycling her bike and she's she actually really quite enjoys the climbing wall so that's really good but we hadn't really tried to do anything much with the running um but then since lockdown it seemed like a good way to to, to, to take her out and get some exercise so we gave her um we gave her a little pair of trainers and like a headband <laughs> so she felt like she was part of it and then we went running um just on a little loop but it was really like uh you know there no pressure it was just supposed to be really fun and uh we we sort of made it like clambering up and down and jumping off things and sort of collecting flowers on the way and, and actually she's totally loved it i think because at that age they're just sort of finding their feet aren't they they've gone from that sort of like slightly um uncoordinated sort of toddler phase where they look really inefficient and you think please don't run because you're just going to go splat to actually they're suddenly they actually can almost 
don't almost do it um, and she's really enjoying it actually so just trying to keep the pressure off and make it fun if she wants to to go then we make her feel like she's going on a proper run with mummy or a proper run with daddy and we go and do a little trail loop around the, like a couple of k or something and she, she's actually really enjoying it but you know how it is with kids it probably won't last so. yeah. <laughs> brilliant thank you for that um just go back to a few questions from uh people who are on the uh watched it this evening um have you got any recommendations for kit clothing shoes or anything like that um that's a that's a big question uh yeah i mean there's things that i use you know that i kind of like loved pieces of kit i suppose um some would be so i have like a really nice wind top um I think it's an Arcteryx wind top, but it doesn't matter what it is really, to the extent that I've just find, I've had several over the years. I just find them a really, really useful piece of kit for trail running because quite often, you know, you're quite warm when you're running, particularly in the hills, but the thin layer just really cuts out that, you know, um, that wind chill factor and uh, it just makes a huge difference. And it's so light and so tiny. You can just stuff it in your vest. You can just stuff it in a bum bag, whatever, however, whatever you're carrying. Um, and it makes a huge difference. So that, that's definitely um, one of my, one of my top bits. Um, in terms of footwear, it's just so personal. I mean, I, I've always, well, I started out running in Walsh's, but then more recently I've been running in Innovates for years. Um, but uh, as I've been doing a bit more distance, I've definitely also been wearing some La Sportiva shoes uh, for sky running, a little bit more cushioning in the middle. Um, but it's just impossible to make a recommendation because it just depends, you know, on the shape of your foot and what you like and what kind of a runner you are and your race and, you know, but yeah, so it's a tricky one. Okay, hope that helps, Helen. <laughs> um, Susan Byrne asks, um, um okay she asks what kit do you carry to keep safe so you're you're um part of the mountain rescue as well aren't you do you, do you work with them <laughs> well i have done but i'm not anymore since i've got the kids i uh, my husband is also on the was also on the team so we ended up that between the two of us one of us could only have <laughs> any one of us could ever go because is we couldn't leave the children alone so i left the team after but after a number of years but um but yeah in terms of safety stuff that i carry on the hill i always carry um a first aid kit i always carry a little survival bag um if uh, yeah a little head torch um and if it's winter i usually carry a couple actually um because there's a much higher chance of being benighted early on um and um I've more recently got a personal locator beacon, although I rarely take it out, but I do think that's quite good if you're going to be on your own running a long way in, you know, somewhere remote maybe or somewhere you're not familiar with. Um, obviously the basic sort of navigation uh, stuff, so map and compass. Um, and if I'm guiding, then I always have, you know, a group shelter or something like that and, and a bigger kind of first aid kit and, and I have lots of spare layers. You know, I think when you're running on your own in the hills, you just have to, or to be running you don't really want your bag to be heavy obviously but you have to completely trade that off against the fact that if anything happens you're totally on your own so um people often say to me yeah but I, I run hot I don't really need this layer or that layer and I'm thinking, but it's not how hot you run it's how hot you feel when you've been sitting with a sprained ankle for three hours and it's freezing cold and you know you just cool down so quickly um whatever you take with you is not going to be enough but you know i think i always go on the side of caution and have uh, plenty of warm layers so a, a sort of a, a synthetic jacket of some kind um you know maybe not in the middle of summer right enough but you know in the autumn or the spring uh, and definitely in the winter I would, I would have really a lot of thermal layers with me and, and tend to take um several pairs of gloves if it's winter because as soon as you put your hands down on anything and they get wet and you get cold it's really hard to come back from so yeah that kind of stuff great thank you um just in terms of just in terms of kind of um skills that you you would sort of encourage people to have if they're going to go off on on big runs obviously navigation being a key one um girls on hills run a number of sort of courses around navigation and things like that um but what would be aside from the navigate or in addition to the navigation, what other thing would you recommend um, people would make sure they, they sort of were familiar with before going off on their own? 
I think it depends a little bit on the, on the kinds of trails that you're going to be running. You know, where we work here, um, then when you're go even if you're going into the mountains, you're not going up the mountains, you effectively need the same skill set um, because you're going to a quite a remote place and the weather changes quite dramatically and the water levels can change quite dramatically, the visibility. Um, and so, yeah, obviously navigation is really important, but things like... Um, knowing how to to cross rivers plan routes that avoid um you know river crossings that might become uncrossable in the conditions or knowing how to um plan a, a route with a number of escape options so that if you're up in the hills you can say you know if the weather deteriorates and say that a storm rolled in and you needed to get down but you are still a long way from where you'd planned to descend you know you, you can just you've already thought through perhaps uh, a number of options for getting down that would be safe, you know, rather than just going, oh, I'll just go down there or just get down as soon as I can. So I guess what I'm trying to say there is is route planning as well as navigation. So knowing what makes a good a good route, but having a, made backup plans as well for when if and when things don't go well, um, and notifying people before you go uh, where you're going and what your what your plans are. Um, and then there's kind of like more technical skills, I suppose. There's, you know, um, scrambling and, um, you know, uh, knowing how to read the weather. And there's, as I mentioned before, river crossings, you know, knowing how to deal with how, when it's safe to cross a river and when it's not. Um, and, and just basic kind of mountain savvy, really. I think if you're going to be trail running in remote places in the UK, then you're looking at the same sort of skill set that you would need to go to go hill walking or you know in the, in the mountains okay um lisa marshall asks how do you motivate yourself this is a good one for me as well how do you motivate yourself when your head really isn't in a run um or do you just love every run because <laughs> no i definitely don't that's that's <laughs> definitely something that i think is a bit of a myth that people think oh just because you you know, you're a running guide or you work running as your work that you must love it the whole time. Um, and that's definitely not true. I struggle with motivation a lot. Um, and yeah, it depends. I think sometimes it's a bit of a trick of the mind. I just tell myself I won't, I don't need to do anything big or hard. I just need to just get out the door and do something little. And I often find that if you can just get out the door, you're halfway there. And by the time you actually get out and start, it's much, much easier to do something harder. Or, you know, for example, if you need to do a speed session and you really don't want to do it, just, oh, I just won't do it. I'll just go for a wee jog and then, and then I'll get out and see how I feel. When you get out, they are oh, all right. Oh, it's not so bad, you know? Um, but also if I'm doing something longer, if I'm trying to build mileage, I use a lot of um, audio books and podcasts and stuff like that to distract myself, to distract me from myself so that I can just shut the world out really. And sometimes that helps a little bit with the sense of flow. I can sometimes be like, oh, where did those three hours go? Um, and it's just zoomed past. I could have been sitting in a cinema. I haven't really been concentrating. I think that's quite nice if you're trying to... Um, pass you know pass the mile pass the time on uh, on a run where you've got to do a lot of miles and and that helps helps me get out the door as well yeah great um an unusual quest question from um florenza i think it is um she she obviously wears glasses or contact lenses and she asks how do you cope um with wearing glasses or contacts during your your long runs um so yeah I um, I do have quite dry eyes actually, and I do struggle with wearing contacts for a long time. Um, but uh, I never run really in my glasses. I did have a period where I couldn't wear contacts, and it was terrible. I hated hated running in my glasses. Um, and so yeah, I just I literally just um, if I, I guess if I had that issue, I would literally just carry. I have like dry eye drops, and I just carry them a little bottle with me, and I can. Can use those and I just keep the lenses in and, and I find that's fine to deal with if it's like a multi-day thing so I always used to find it quite nerve-wracking on mountain marathons because I used to carry I have like monthly disposals and I used to carry them in my pack and had to put uh, sorry daily disposals I had to put a new pair in in the morning and it was always really nerve-wracking trying to put this thing in without a mirror inside a tent and thinking if I, if I drop this I can't see for the rest of this event you know um and it was a really scary moment trying to put this lens in every time um so you know 
yeah if you can avoid having to do that then that's 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 really good for you but no i've just had to deal with it just to put the lenses in wear them and, and keep them as moisturized as possible and carry a couple of spares if you have to i've actually knocked them out with my walking poles my running poles in the past giving myself a bonk and lost one so i think it's worth having one in your bag if you can yeah, so don't weigh much. <laughs> yeah. no I've, I've been there while camping and um trying to put contact lenses and drop yeah. them I'm on the floor and then you're, uh, you're like yeah. looking around in the grass for your yes <laughs> terrifying um, so just a, a couple more questions then if you if that's okay yeah. um what was um victoria um bentley asks what was the most challenging aspect of setting up girls on hills because how old is girls on hills now this is its th third year so still yeah. quite young um the most challenging aspect it's probably been was probably just making the taking the leap to, to, to do it in the first place I, i'd actually had the idea or something similar for many years before um and just always thought well i can't possibly do that you know that's a ridiculous idea it's like a pipe dream um and not really having the the confidence to to do it um and actually you know doing it with nancy and having two people involved and and having somebody to bounce ideas off and to say look we should just do it just get let's just jump and just put it out there and have a go um, and that was definitely the hardest bit because and it's not my background to to run a, a business and um you know i didn't really i don't really necessarily know what i'm doing and so we're sort of definitely making it up as we go along um but to an extent that's really exciting it's really interesting um but it was really intimidating because you feel like you're going to get egg on your face you know you just think well what if this all just looks doesn't work and it's all goes pear-shaped but um it's been a really enjoyable journey and it's definitely been worth doing it so yeah that's great um phil phil cox asks what would your advice be for someone that has done a few organized trail runs and wants to take the next steps to go further bigger or longer if you're interested in racing then i think it's a, just a question of finding you know doing the research and finding the event those kinds of events that sort of tick tick the boxes for you i think there is a bit of a step change there between sort of tr if you decide to to go from something like trail running to fell running so something more like a mountain race because there is that navigational aspect where you need to self-navigate and choose your own route potentially and that kind of thing um but if you just want to do a trail race in the mountains i sometimes think that's quite a nice introduction um because you might find a, ra a, a race that has a, a way marked course you know um and you can get up into that environment in a in a if you like in in an organized event where the safety isn't managed and the, the route is managed and everything is there for you um and and it enables you to experience the environment and, and find out if that actually works for you if that actually ticks your boxes or something a bit higher something a bit longer um and and see if that if that works for you um i think if you're going if you're talking about doing something more on your own and 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 adventuring out into the hills then i just think that basically going on a course and learning how to self-navigate and then just literally go and get stuck in go and have a go at it go and explore it. and it's it's a really empowering experience it's brilliant because i think it's i think the mountains are one of the few places left if you like where you actually just make all the decisions yourself you, you know you're allowed to you go out there you decide where you want to go and when and what you carry and uh, how far and which way you're going to come back and nobody tells you what to do and that how much risk you take how much you push is really up to you and it's not part of our culture here in the british mountains to tell people that they're doing it right or they're doing it wrong and and it's just really it's really liberating to be able to go and do that and i definitely would recommend that just going and learning how to read a map and come first taking the things that you need to, to be safe out there and and just you know start small you don't have to go jump straight in the deep end but just to go and do it by yourself is is definitely one of the most rewarding ways of doing it okay brilliant. thank you um bryony asks what what sort of distance do you usually run when you go trail running um i presume you go running most days do you carry whenever uh, you can 
Yeah, not most days, actually. I find, as I mentioned before, I've always been a bit of an injury prone person and it's taken me years to discover the exact balance of rest and training that I need. And I'm I'm one of those people, if I ran every day, I definitely start to pick up niggles uh, and nibbles. Yeah. So um, I I definitely (laughs) uh, sort of maybe run two days on one day off, something like that. Um, But in terms of mileage, uh, it, it really depends what I'm what I'm aiming for. If it's if it's work related, if I'm doing a lot of work, so in the summer season, for example, then definitely not doing huge mileages. It's really steep around where I live and we can sometimes be out on the hills for hours. We've only gone a few miles um, uh, because there's so much ascent and it's such like rough ground. Um, but if I was training, particularly for like an ultra distance event or a sky race, then, you know, I would be looking to push up the mileage of at least one of my training runs during the week um, and I might do something uh, longer at the moment in lockdown if I'm going out on a long run it might be a couple of hours um, but you know it's it's a, a shade of its former self the running at the moment but um, yeah, it, yeah. It, does, it really just depends what I'm I've always got, I know I said I don't race a lot and I don't really but I have usually got something in the back of my mind that I'm training for. Okay so do you, do you have a plan in the week to kind of think I'm going to do, I don't know, 20k on yeah. you know, the middle of the week and sort of, I, I sort of treat it more like see if I'm going to do a race of a certain distance on a certain date in the future. I kind of treat it like I want to build up to that gradually by increasing my distance roughly around about 10% a week um, out on my long run, say, and um, I just sort of don't really look at what my mileage is over a week. I just kind of look at what my mileage of my longest run might be and everything else is kind of supporting type runs. So some hill work and some, some, you know, some speed work or something like that. And then just some easy runs, but I usually have at least one kind of long run that I gradually try to eke up the mileage on. Um, and yeah, it might just be, um, it's, it's actually less like it's a bit less like with road running where I would say I need to do 20k I need to do 30k it tends to I tend to think more in hours and in, in terms of hours on feet or time on feet uh, because I think that is more relevant in the mountains somehow so I tend to think in terms of like oh, I need to go on a long run so I'm going to go on three or four hours or I'm going to be half a day or I'm going to be out all day um, that kind of approach that's really interesting thank you um, Ruth asks do you feel safe running in the mountains on your own? Yeah, uh, definitely. And uh, I think it's funny when I look back, I mean, it's taken me a long time to get to that position. Um, I didn't always feel that way. But when I look back and all the kind of nightmare scenarios that I've had in the past where you make mistakes and errors, it's almost always been because I've been in a group of people or I followed somebody else or I didn't, you know, I've not wanted to pipe up and say something or, you know, I, d- I don't necessarily feel you know I definitely don't feel more at risk being in the hills running or or whatever you know by myself I think um I think it's important that when you're in the mountains that you are uh, realize that you know ultimately the responsibility lies with you even if you're in a group of people because you have to you know sometimes people will seem like they know a lot more about what they're doing or they seem really confident but it might be that they don't necessarily know or are any more confident than you are Um, and so I think when you go up there you have to imagine if a worst case scenario happened and that person that you're hiking with and and relying on um, was to to get to get injured and you had to go for help then you know the buck stops with you so I think you you have to sort of take that approach Um, and that's why I think learning how to navigate and learning how to look after yourself is such a empowering experience because then basically after that you're free to go where you want with whoever you know and make your own decisions and and being able we you know when you get back and you've you've done all that yourself and you feel that you've done it well i think it's a rewarding experience like i did that you know i did that by myself yeah yeah right. um just two more questions if if i might uh there's a question here from anonymous um he says have a traumatic brain injury and have found that running in the mountains reduces my cognitive load. Um, has Girls on Hills worked with people with neurological conditions at all? No, we haven't. Um, but I'm I'm not surprised to to hear that because it, only in that 
it never ceases to amaze me the, the, the sort of benefits that people get um, from from running and from being out in in the hills and in the mountains. Um, so we, we haven't come across that, but we we have we often well, we always take kind of medical information from the people that we we take out running, and and we see all kinds of different um, medical conditions and and uh, people's in people's backgrounds and. Um, so many people come to the sport to to find uh, a way of managing that or relief um, and particularly um around sort of mental health and those kinds of things um we it was it was something actually really took us by surprise when we first started uh running we didn't expect people to feel um to be using the hill so much as therapy if you like um and to, to and actually to feel that they could open up and talk um more more freely um about about you know their situation uh, when they're out in the hill and, and that's been a really uh, interesting uh, sort of aspect of girls on hills for us has made it really rewarding um but yeah that's interesting to hear that um and fi final question um what's as a if there was a well adam is um hasn't started running yet but what's the one bit of advice you'd give him um uh, he's thinking about maybe a trail run to kick things off um what would you say to him as a, a complete beginner what's the one bit of advice i would say that um my advice would be to just it sounds a bit sounds a bit boring but it's just to build up to build up gradually because i think if you I think trail running is really addictive and I think people get into it and they think, oh, this is amazing. I'm just going to throw myself in there. And before you know it, they've gone, I'll do a 5K, I'll do a 10, I'll do a 50K, I'm going to do an ultra next week. And people just go go crazy because they fall in love with it and they want to do it. And, and when I meet new runners, the thing that strikes me uh, a lot of the time is, especially if they've found something they feel passionate about, is... Um, it never occurs to them that they're going to pick up a running injury. And, and you have to remember that even though the instance of injury in trail running is lower than in other in other types of running like road running for example um you still can get injured it is a repetitious sport it is a high impact sport um, and there's a lot of kind of particularly as you start moving into longer distance running there is that kind of overuse aspect and if you do it right and you build up gradually you don't have to necessarily pick up a running injury but they are so common and it's such a shame for it to happen and if i could sort of go back to my I for myself I felt like, slow down go a bit just just build up gradually um, and don't just go crazy and jump straight in the in the deep end and injure yourself because once you start building up niggles it's quite hard to to not carry carry them around with you as you you know continue to, to do more and more mileage so I definitely would say whilst you're not a runner build it build up into being one with with that in mind so that you can build from a really strong base great that's great great advice thank you Karen. um so that, I mean, that's really all we've got time for. So um, just wanted to say thank you to Kerry. Um, that's been really, really interesting. Um, if you want to check out a bit more um, about the courses that Girls on Hills uh, offer, then it's girlsonhills.com, is it, Kerry? Yeah. 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 Um, so go there. They do lots of different courses, running with lots of, um, lots of other uh, women in the mountains. And as soon as they're allowed, they'll be starting back up again, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Ernest. Um, at the beginning I, I mentioned about uh, entering a competition uh, so I'm just posting a link to uh, to how you can fill out um, a little entry form um, based on things that Kerry's spoken about. Um, if you'd like to win a £50 Alice Brigham voucher then go ahead to that link just copy and paste it into your browser and um, we'll enter you into the draw. Uh, which will be done on Friday night um, and that's that's really um, everything and um, yeah just to say thank you again to Kerry. No, thank, thank you, to you. Everyone. thanks for having me, thanks for listening. <laughs> no problem at all and um, yeah thank you to everyone for joining us this evening and um, yes yeah, stay, stay safe and stay active everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.